welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We're so privileged today to have uh, Carol, Carol Downer and uh, Rochelle Glickman, one of our FIST uh, members, and Jimena Diaz from Argentina here with us today. And I'm gonna, I'm going to now um, read the bio for Carol Downer. She has been a leader in the reproductive rights movement for five decades. She started the self-help branch of the women's health movement. She was tried and acquitted of practicing medicine without a license in 1972. Her group, the Feminist Women's Health Center, started and ran abortion clinics around the country. She presently is the vice president of the board of three clinics in Northern California, women's health specialists. She has written several books and is presently studying population control by government and how it perpetuates white supremacy and class privilege. She invites inquiries by those who want to join this study project. So we're so happy to have Carol with us today. I'm going to just briefly um, mention that our other guests, our other speakers include uh, Rochelle Glickman, who's a longtime lesbian feminist and member of Feminists in Struggle. And then we also are privileged to have Jimena Diaz, who's a psychologist, feminist, and women's rights activist. And, uh, you know, our, our title for today's, for today's um, feminist forum is, oh my goodness, I'm not finding it here. <laughs> Want to read it? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> okay. Our bodies, our lives, the struggle to save women's reproductive rights. That's right. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So um, thank you so much again for being here, everyone. And let's go ahead. And Carolyn, if you'd like to start, we're going to have Carolyn, uh, Carolyn and, then, um, and then Rochelle and then Jimena speak. So go ahead, Carol. Share a screen. <laughs> okay. One second. I'm going to get her slideshow going. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we can, we can hear you. Yeah. Let me get the slideshow up. All right. Okay. There, now they can see. Excellent. You just click the arrow when you want to move to the next song. Hi. <laughs> Hi there. Um, okay, I'm going to open my talk with some very, very good news that we often forget or if we knew it in the first place. And that is that um, most people, men and women, uh, in this country and to greater or lesser extent than others, favor women having access to abortion, okay? That polls show this again, again, and again, regardless of the um, that, you know, the media and all of the, uh, and government and all of the, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> characterization. The truth is that 20% uh, are in our camp, they favor abortion or in other things, um, you know, on demand. Um, however, 60% and sometimes more think it should be available uh, under most circumstances. Uh, so why, given the fact that this is a very uh, well accepted by the public, uh, even though there's a 20% that are very much against it and they are represented by powerful people often, mm -hmm. um, why is it that, you know, we always feel like we're um, having to uh, argue the moral uh, arguments and so forth. Um, I am just going to cut to the chase since we don't have much time today and say that it is that comes down to uh, shame and it comes down to ignorance of our own bodies. 
and therefore our voices are muted. And I see that uh, and that's the bad news. I mean, we, we don't know anything about our bodies often and uh, we're scared of them and we uh, are ashamed of them. Uh, the good news is that we did find over the years in the, when we started the second wave, uh, we found that, hey, uh, women want to know about our bodies. They welcome it. Um, okay. And um, just, just one second. There you go. All right. Um, and the, um, though they, they actually do welcome it. Now this, this slide, the reason I have this is because obviously uh, we're going to be hearing about the latest things in Argentina. I'm really anxious to hear those. And um, we, you know, also had our wonderful uh, demonstrations and continue to. But I chose this slide because it features a, a young, uh, blonde, white woman. And unfortunately, um, it turned out that that represented the majority of our movement. Uh, we, most of us were, were white middle-class women, uh, blonde and you know, very young university women. And uh, we, um, I, I was older uh, when I came into the women's movement, but generally women were very young. Um, and we were great, and believe me, it was a wonderful time. Uh, and the tools to do it are accessible, easy to use. There's the speculum, the mirror, and the light. And um, we found that we get together, and, and before you know it, we, uh, you know, all these uh, old doctor's tales just get blown out of the water. And uh, all of our uteruses are tipped. It doesn't mean anything. Um, the cervical erosion is just in a irritation. Uh, we learned to distinguish so-called discharges uh, from our natural secretions. I mean, it's just instantly. Um, I, I won't go into great detail, but just to say this, this swept the country and we traveled around the country and women uh, learned to do self-examination. Uh, and um, that led to many other discoveries, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so um, they want, the thing that we discovered when we were um, writing our book to describe what we had done was that this, um, our, it was not an accident that we didn't know anything about our bodies. Even our doctors didn't know about our bodies. Uh, this is a slide out of a kind of call textbook of 1903. Um, a couple of feminist um, scholars uh, surveyed, um, Lisa Jean Moore and Adele Clark, surveyed about 100 uh, textbooks over the last 100 years and found that up until the very last decade or so, or, you know, a couple decades, um, this was all even doctors saw. Here's a side view, and as you can see, there's the uterus and the, um, the bladder and uh, the entrance to the uh, vagina. And that little red dot is the clitoris, <laughs> believe it or not. That is what they represented on their book. That's what your gynecologist thought the clitoris was. It, it was not known that women had the extensive sex organ that we do. Uh, it, it was known at one time in the 17th century, it was very well known. And in the, up through the 18th, 19th century, it was in uh, all gynecology books. But then in 1850, um, they found out through the microscope, they saw a sterilization. And they found that, uh, what do you know? Uh, it didn't even matter whether the woman had pleasure or not. Uh, fertilization didn't take place until hours, maybe days after, um, you know, sex. And um, so a woman could even be unconscious when she had sex. Uh, that has happened. Uh, women have been raped, whatever, and 
what do you know that it doesn't matter if they even knew that they were having sex they could get pregnant so why bother and besides a you know let's focus on what's important to them which was our reproduction and um so therefore uh, that 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 was now here is actually is with the skin off here is um, our wonderful clitoris and um, actually even this could be enlarged upon a bit um, but these uh, colored portions are the the erectile tissue of our clitoris and this is uh, uh, of, of when they are not erect when they when these uh, tissues swell just as a penis does in under excitement uh, it gets about, oh, I don't know, many times larger than it is and puffs out, as we, as we all know. Um, so getting, moving right along here, the other big discovery was the fact that um, not only did we learn how to do abortions on our own, we also learned that we could extract our menstrual period whenever we wanted to with another you know, group of women that knew just minimally things about using this device invented by Lorraine Rothman uh, with a uh, <clears throat> bottle, a co collection jar, which has a tube leading uh, to a cannula, which I don't know if you can see it very well here, but it's uh, up in the right-hand upper corner. Uh, that's a sort of straw-like tube that can be inserted into the uterus. Of course, you put the speculum in first to make way and you don't touch the sides and you take the sterile cannula, go in and using, then over here you have your syringe, you pump the syringe, which creates the suction and you suction the material out. And in a, oh, a typical period, maybe you'll get your collection jar may have like an inch or so of uh, menstrual material uh, now but that will be the bulk of your your month's period uh, with some women it's more some less um, at any rate uh, if you can do this safely up and, and without pain up until about uh, oh you missed your you missed your second period or excuse me yeah and um that's six weeks or eight weeks, depending on how you count it. And um, that can be done safely. And um, that, to say the least, um, changed the game. It was a game changer. In fact, in the Roe v. Wade uh, decision, Justice Blackman mentions menstrual extraction as one of the new technologies. And uh, believe me, it had an impact on them knowing that women were learning to do it themselves. Um, now, those were, that's all the, the wonderful good news that we, um, I can report in terms of uh, banishing shame and curing this ignorance, learning we can have orgasms and so forth. Um, the other is that we made some mistakes and, and they turned out to be pretty pretty serious mistakes um, and I certainly was a participant here so I'm uh, owning up uh, to this um, that uh, although our group did know a lot more about the population control movement than uh, the many um, in the women's health movement and uh, really all of just a general movement because you realize there was a broader movement and they didn't know zilch about the population control movement, frankly. Um, uh, you know, they just, it was all about um, overcoming the Catholic church and getting abortion. You know, that was, that was what mainly drove us at that time. Um, at any rate, um, I have a picture here of Planned Parenthood, which, uh, and I don't know what Planned Parenthood is called in, uh, Argentina is it um, planning familiar or something like that um, it's but it's all over the world and uh, it has basically taken over in the United States for sure uh, the women's health 
move, uh, movement, the reproductive rights movement. Uh, they speak for us, uh, everybody. When they donate, um, it's always, uh, you know, some people tell us at the health center, oh, I sent you a check. Well, they sent Planned Parenthood's check because they, that has become identified with it. The problem with Planned Parenthood is that it's a population control organization. And while it is, you know, certainly done a, certain, a lot of good work in certain areas, particularly uh, in um, fighting lawsuits, uh, could get that, I think, one of, one of the things. It also um, is mostly just concerned about solving the world's problems, uh, such as uh, overpopulation and uh, uh, environmental degradation by reducing the number of poor people. <laughs> Uh, and uh, that turns out to be pretty racist and classist. And so we found ourselves in bed with these people. And I actually, when I say in bed, they were the boss. Uh, they, they've actually been pretty harmful to our women's uh, reproductive rights movement. They go into local communities and uh, strong arm the uh, local women's health activists to keep a low profile, don't talk about abortion, et cetera. They, they dominate, uh, they control the message. Um, and, um, you know, to them, uh, the only good pregnancy is an aborted pregnancy. Um, and they, they do nothing to help with the women who want to have children, who are pregnant. They have no, they, dispense drugs, drugs and devices only. You cannot get a diaphragm at a Planned Parenthood. Uh, you cannot uh, learn fertility awareness. You cannot, um, if you're lucky if you learn about condoms, you know, that's about it. And um, they're the ones that, you know, call the shots. So this is my, my very rapid um, summary of uh, 50 years of uh, trial and error. And uh, hopefully um, this time around, because we are facing a very serious crisis here, we will not fall into the same uh, traps. We will not just be gravitating toward the funders. Uh, we will look to our own means and our own resources, and we will um, unite with the women of color, and not only because it will double or triple our numbers, but because they have uh, a, um, a insight and awareness that we don't, we as white, I'm speaking as a white woman, that we don't have. And um, our problem, and frankly, they don't always understand this either. There's a flip side of this. They don't understand always what it's like to be, uh, primarily a breeder. And that is what, uh, for the last hundred years in the United States, uh, that the um, industrial, with the Industrial Revolution, this is what um, corporations have been concerned about. They wanted to bring in all these people uh, to work in the factories, but they didn't like that they had babies. So they've been pressing the uh, old stock, so to speak, uh, to have babies. And that's what abortion laws were all about, was to keep us producing white babies. Um, well, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. <laughs> uh, that is, uh, oh, oh, I, God, how can I, I, I won't, I will just talk a second though, because I have a feeling my time is out. Um, this is a um, memo from the Planned Parenthood from 1969. Of course, today they would not have this be public, but they, it still remains their policies, I assure you, from working closely in this field. Um, and I just have starred some kind of shocking, because <clears throat> it's a big uh, list of all the measures that you could do to reduce fertility. Well, one of them is increase, uh, encourage increased homosexuality, which surprises some people that it's on this list. Uh, but think about it a second. Homosexuals classically or typically or stereotypically um, uh, don't have children. Of course, we all know that's not true. But 
uh, they they think it's true, and uh, so you know they it it helps for those of us who are concerned, and I'm one of them that um, you know the whole category of uh, sex has been you know completely preempted by gender, and is uh, you know erasing um, females uh, that. Um, you know, this is um, why we've seen the queer movement just explode, really, over the last, you know, couple of decades. Uh, and it's President um, Biden just, you know, is taking a step in that direction on having, um, wherever it says, uh, no discrimination on the basis of sex, that this now also means gender. Or in fact, that they've supplemented it. Um, this Collapse. eliminate welfare payments after first two children. Well, what, what, does, what do you do when you have two children and you're still 25 years or 30 years old? Uh, well, you get a, you get a steril, sterilized is what you do. So this t amounts to co you know, forced sterilization. And uh, this is, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, the women's movement did not really uh, give adequate uh, emphasis to, and I don't think they do still. Now, this last one, and I'll close with that, is chronic depression. Now, that might surprise you being on this list, that they would actually recommend chronic depression uh, to reduce fertility. Ah, but wait. Reminding you that one of the chief and common, in fact, it is the chief common problem in the birth control pill, is mild chronic depression. Now, maybe you think I'm kind of a conspiracy buff or something uh, to even be bringing this up, but think about it a second. This is millions of women that take this pill. And many of them experience this. I've read many accounts and I know women who have uh, been depressed for years until they stop taking the pill and miraculously um, their depression lifted and the life looked good again. So I'm just going to sum up and say, um, let's be careful who we ally with and how we ally with them, recognizing them that they're, uh, you know, compared to us, it's, they're giants, they have the funding, they have the government support, they have the national, they have the history, um, they can swamp us. And so our movement has to be very careful in associating with them and uh, having them as allies. And then let's have a broad reproductive rights program. Let's not just focus on abortion, as important as it is. And uh, I think we'll find that we'll have a broad-based movement with a lot more power and a lot more fun. So. Carol, I think you're on mute. <laughs> the other oh, Carol. <laughs> yeah. I, no, not me. Oh, okay. But uh, okay, it was <clears throat> so that uh, that completes the slideshow. Then, Carol. Uh, yes. Oh, I, I, I could uh, talk on and on, <laughs> yeah. of course. But I no, I just wanted to. These are things that I think um, uh, are uh, things that we learn, and both good and and mistakes that we made that are. I hope will guide us in the future. A uh, question I have is where where did you get that document? 
on God. We, we've had it for many years, but it, it, uh, of the antis have it online, of course. You know them, they have everything. Um, it, it can't, you can find it. Uh, uh, the uh, person, it's the, the source, I'll read this to you. Frederick S. Jaffe, Fred Jaffe, J-A-F-F-E. And it's a memorandum to Bernard Berelson, and it's dated March 11th, 1969. And it's out of Family Planning Perspectives, I believe. And um, I, 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 I knew Fred Jaffe. He was very prominent. He was the head for many years in Planned Parenthood. I did not know him well. I had been introduced to him at a meeting, but... Well, we have a question here from Jessica. She wanted to know, uh, was the plan aimed at all women in the U.S. or did they target black women or other women of color? Wait, was the plan what? Uh, was the plan aimed at all women in the U.S. or did they target women of color? Oh, my goodness. Um, this is all about women of color. I mean, I hope I've made that really plain. Oh, you mean it's, uh, this was only aimed at women of color? Well, uh, there is a, a uh, letter that accompanies this memo. I have the, the, the whole memo. And in it, that same question is asked um, or addressed uh, that some people say, well, um, fertility is not a problem for um, U.S. women. Uh, in fact, at that point, white women's fertility was below replacement level or very very close um you know so why are you uh, pushing this in the united states um because and he answered and basically it was in in, in bureaucratic you know bureaucracy speak i mean you have to realize he's wording this in a very very uh you know, soft way, is that it isn't that much of a problem in the United States. It is uh, more an international problem. However, we have to offer a good example. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that is, it, 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 you're, you're right, it seemingly seems a bit contradictory. Uh, because of the fact that, um, in in fact, it was in 1865 that was the first time that female U.S. white middle class women had a lower birth rate than they had ever had in history, and it was new and it was the news, the big news of the day, and a very great concern to them. And that's when they started slapping on it, uh, abortion uh, being outlawed in the United States. As a, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, yes. Uh, as an old ZPG person myself, zero population growth. Um, I mean, I I believe that, and I don't know how other people on the call believe, but I I think uh, human population is really out of control, and and we do need to be very seriously addressing that. But you know, I think I think the whole um, <clears throat> you know that it's been addressed very unevenly. Um, it sounds like you know. I mean, I think that that um, a lot of these things were directed more at people of color, for sure. Uh, well, I, I want to point out to you that the UN scenario, uh, you know, that they've laid out, um, feel that um, the population of the world is uh, slowing down, um, population growth, and they expect in the year 2050 for it to uh, level off. And um, yeah. I mean, oh, these these are the you know people that are. Um, no, 
in charge of keeping track of these statistics. That's quite a while, wait, wait a while from now. I mean, we have eight, over 8 billion people on the planet and all of the resources are being used up a lot. But I mean, that's, that's just my uh, reaction to this. I, I don't know if other people want to. Yeah, I wanted to. Yeah, this is Anne. Said, I think the pandemic is addressing population control. Yeah. This is Anne. I was just going to say that first, I recommend a book called Birth Strike, which uh, talks about how women's bodies are manipulated. Um, my memory of the involvement in abortion rights struggles was very much did link to being opposed to forced sterilization, which was a big issue at that point. And we did link those two and we fought for you know, women to have real control over their bodies and not be forced to either have children or not have children. Uh, so um, that was kind of our position and, and we focus on abortion and on opposing forced sterilization. So I think that we have to see that as, as part of the history and we actually did a lot of really great stuff around that issue as well. Um, so, and I also think that when women have control over our bodies and we're not being manipulated and forced and we have real options and economic support, um, that the problems, of, if there is a, to the extent there's a problem of overpopulation, it'll take care of itself. Um, but I think women need to be able to have that power uh, to make those decisions, yeah. to have the support we mm -hmm. need when we want to have children. Well, I know that's a position of uh, the organization, right? And, and um, I want to say that um, we have a precedent here or a model is that in Sweden um, in the uh, late 40s, 1945, Gunnar Myrdal wrote a book about this in which they, uh, he was a very Nobel Prize winner um, and a sociologist that you know, hold a, wrote, wrote a book about the dilemma between population control and democracy and, you know, giving women choice. And he openly discusses these issues and it's very interesting. Uh, and at that time, uh, the women in Sweden, I mean, Sweden was facing a severe decline in population. Um, and um, that they, they really were not producing enough people to even, you know, man the uh, uh, factories <laughs> that they had, had built, mm -hmm. you know, for the next generation. Um, so they, they were alarmed. Mm -hmm. uh, but the feminists at that time in Sweden uh, came forth and said, well, you know, if you want us to have children, you better make sure that those children have a good life. Uh, we can't just bring children into the world without some assurance. Yeah. And uh, the government responded. And that's why uh, and it spread. That's why in Europe, um, you know, there was child support, uh, housing uh, provided, um, and, you know, women enjoy um, a lot more status. Now, that does not happen to be the case here. So we don't, yeah. we don't have the leverage that they had. I mean, it's a bargaining thing. Yeah, and some people would argue that, of course, has to do with with um, a lot of the capitalism, which is, you know, vulture capitalism to some degree, you know, where we have, um, I mean, I think there are pretty dark motives at, at work wanting people to uh, reproduce, you know, because, uh, you know, how else are they going to continue all of these wars for profit and and have all the consumers and um yeah, really. oh, that oh, they want you know that's, that's exactly why we're facing this situation now it's not because people suddenly uh you know started getting worried about the fetus uh it's it's it, uh, absolutely i i i mentioned planned parenthood because those are the people that shared some of our goals I mean, obviously, they had goals that we weren't happy about, or at least I'm not. And, uh, <clears throat> but, <clears throat> no, there's a very powerful, uh, it's, I mean, of course, the, the Catholic Church is always the figurehead that we see. I mean, they, they were prominent uh, in it, 
But no, it's industrial capitalism. You're absolutely right. And uh, that's why we're facing this retrenchment now. It's mm -hmm. why, why it's going away. It's not because, as I said, it's not because of the polls. It's not because suddenly people are uh, getting queasy about abortion. It is 100% political. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, Eleanor had a comment here. I'm into voluntary extinction. Let's just all die out. I don't know if that was a joke, <laughs> if that's uh, serious, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, a joke. Sorry, she said, but um, yeah. Anyway, and then Jessica wrote, "We still have among the lowest birth rate in Europe, together with Italy's here in Sweden." And they, well, like in, in Europe now, uh, you, you do not have citizenship by birth. That's how they've solved it there. That's how they bring in the migrant workers uh, mm -hmm. in all these countries. Uh, they let them come in and, and work, but uh, their children are not, you know, given citizenship of that country. Uh, it, it's... Yes, Amina, I wanted to answer her question. We are recording this for those who missed the beginning. Um, but yeah, and are there any other questions or comments people would like to make at this point? We'll have more time to discuss things a little at the end, but we probably, if you're finished um, with your presentation, Carol, thank you so much. Oh, you're very, very welcome. Yeah. Um, then we will, we will move on then to our, our next speaker and we'll have a, a few minutes to ask a few questions and for comments after she speaks as well. Go ahead then, Rochelle, Rochelle Glickman. She's a longtime feminist and member of our Feminists in Struggle and she was gonna share some about some of her personal experiences in this, oh. this issue. Okay, um, my name is Rochelle and I'm a member of FIST. And I was asked to speak because I've also had the personal experience of having an abortion. However, I do want to say that um, I'm going to be 70 this summer. And I'm talking about an experience that happened when I was in my late 20s. So there's a lot of water under the bridge here. However, uh, one thing that sticks with me is my emotional experience at the time. You know, we're talking about having a child. When it happens to you personally, it's, um, it's a big deal. It's a big deal in the sense that you have the potential here of something that you're going to be responsible for, essentially for the rest of your life. So um, it's, it's, I never saw it in terms of whether um, of population control or any of these political things. It was just a personal crisis in my life. And um, <clears throat> crisis isn't even in the word. Because what I also want to say is that I've noticed that the anti-choice people, a lot of times, at least they have in the past, have talked about the emotional trauma that this has for women. And um, they bring up the whole guilt thing. I mean, they, they went on and on with, with, with women who, who um, spoke out having been tormented by guilt and shame. None of this is what I felt at all. Um, I remember at the time, you know, I was in no position to have a child, um, but I, I, had, I had mixed feelings, I'll be honest. Um, a part of me, you know, it, it, it seemed at the time to be somewhat of a big deal, but I also knew that I would have to, you know, raise the child myself and that I was in no condition either uh, financially or emotionally to do it. So that's why I decided to have have the abortion and I was lucky that I was able to do it under very good circumstances so I didn't have any physical complications and as I said it was not an emotional trauma it was a difficult situation but that's not the same thing as a trauma and I can tell you that um, afterwards I remember having a dream of an empty nest and that probably comes the closest to expressing how I felt that yeah, there was a sense of, of loss, loss of, of something that could have been, but not that it was. I didn't feel grief, I didn't feel guilt, 
I didn't feel major trauma, just a sense of a loss of a possibility. And, you know, when I look back on it now, um, it was a very good thing that I did for myself, or just a good thing in general, just personally, because um, that kind of responsibility, I think, uh, would have hampered my coming out as a lesbian, which meant a great deal to me. At the time, it still does. So I, I think it would have been difficult and impossible to do that and, and a lot of other things. Also, my emotional state at the time. You know, having a child is not just um, you're, you're providing for it physically, but you have to provide for it emotionally. And I was in no condition to do that. So I think all those things, you know, I knew that I had made the right decision. And talking this way and listening to everything that's been said, this is not something that I, I think the notion of being pro-choice is just that, pro-choice. It's up to the individual woman who has to review her circumstances and make that decision herself. Nobody, nobody has the right or should have the right to make that decision for anybody else. You know, we're, we're human beings, not um, breeding machines. <laughs> uh, it's true women have the capacity to have children, but we're more than just that too. And um, I think that that is always, I've always felt that way. So I never had any regrets and I never looked back and I never had any trauma. And it just infuriated me to listen to, to, to all the anti-choice people talk about how devastated women were and blah, 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 blah. I never felt that way. And, and I've had a lot of other difficulties in my life and I have felt guilt over a lot of different things and that was not it. Mm -hmm. uh, now I just want to connect it um, with my work as a member of, of Feminist in Struggle, which is to see this whole issue in terms of building movements, as Carol said, you know, the broader, obviously, the better, um, because I, I don't think that you can ever rely on politicians or people at the top to do anything for you. Everything has gotten done. In fact, we, we got, we got uh, abortion rights by having a movement, and all the gains that human beings have won, generally, they've won by forming movements, not relying on those in power. So I think that's really, really important. Um, the broader it is, obviously, the better. But another thing occurred to me, and that's the notion of, of falling population and needing people. Um, I, I kept thinking of the fact that uh, with automated, or, or, robots and, and artificial intelligence, I think there's going to be a less need of people. And um, I, I, I'm not so sure that human beings are really even going to be necessary at one point with, with, with um, artificial intelligence and robots. So I don't know if I would agree that that's behind all this, um, but I, I do think that, that whatever the case is, we're going to have a really, really hard time now to recreate a, a woman's movement. And part of it is because if women can't define who we are, then I think that that, that makes it harder. That's kind of a really basic thing that, you know, back when the, the, we were dealing with reproductive rights and all those other things that, that, you know, like equal pay, we didn't have any problems with defining. Women were women, that was understood. Now it's like taking a step back to have to define that. And I think it makes it harder. But um, I, 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 people have, have, have dealt with difficulties before in the past. I, I was thinking about the civil rights movement when it got started in, in the, the mid fifties, the atmosphere then was really very um, conformist, very racist, very, um, um, it wasn't, it wasn't friendly. And they certainly were, it, there weren't a lot of other movements. I mean, the women's movement came into being on, on the backs of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. All these things contribute to an atmosphere of, of a very progressive feeling. And now that all that's gone, 
it's almost like we're back in the 50s again, starting from scratch. So it makes it harder, but I don't think it's impossible. So you say we're, it seems like we're back in the 50s again, in what way? Well, okay, we, we when the women's, the second wave started, as I said, we were starting on, on an atmosphere, a very progressive atmosphere. We had had the civil rights movement. That, that was the first movement that got started that, that pushed the notion of, of, of I don't know, um, I can't find the right word for it. But it started something, it started progressive movements. And then we had the anti-war movement. All of this was, was part of the left. And I think the problem now is that the left is, is not, um, it's not as progressive as it once was. It doesn't, it, it, it doesn't look at women except through the lens of gender. And that, that is a problem. So it makes me feel women are kind of on our own in that sense. But that's another reason to make the women's movement as broad as possible. Does that help? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Anna wrote here, I'm afraid it is the natural path of neoliberalism to divide, to make us weaker, to face the power and to, and to get rid of a big portion of the population. Uh, is that a question? <laughs> yeah, that's a comment. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, like I say, I, t I tend to think that they're, they're more behind the push to, um, you know, try to end choice and so forth, because I think it plays into their power to have us, uh, you know, have tremendous amounts of us, but, um, well, but to divide to make us weaker, uh, I would certainly agree with that. I, what do other people think? Could I just say one more thing um, about yeah, the, the neoliberal view or the view of the right is, especially the view of the right is more, you know, to go back to a time when white men had all the power yeah. and women <laughs> were back in the house doing the cooking and the cleaning and having kids. Um, I think that's, that's, that's in a way, in a sad way, it's the only way they can make themselves feel good. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think there's probably more than one thing going on that makes it so different. Oh, yeah. I think, yes, definitely. Um, and then there's the religious aspect. I'm really looking forward to hearing him in a, um, you know, inform us about all of the, <laughs> all of the, <clears throat> Obstructionism, of, or, or really no, far more than that, the opposition, the outright opposition of the Catholic Church in Argentina, as well as uh, rest of Latin America and here and basically everywhere, uh, Eastern Europe to women's choice. Um, I wanted to just note here, Frankie Lawrence, she said some men would like to get rid of women altogether. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe wow. so, but um, are there any other comments or questions right now with regard to uh, to Rochelle's sharing? And if not, it doesn't look like anyone's writing anything in the chat right now, unless I, I need to move this down to make sure. No, looks like there isn't. Uh, so why don't we go yeah, move to you then, uh, unless there was anything else, Rochelle, you'd like to add? Uh, nothing I can think of. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, let's go ahead to Jimena then, and we're so glad to have you here from Argentina uh, to let us know what happened there. You, you recently got abortion legals in that country, so go ahead. Oh, wait a minute. Are you, are you muted? I, oh, I have to, yeah, I keep, I have to ask you to unmute. Um, there we go. Uh, <laughs> go. I hope bring some little silver lighting, maybe. 
Uh, okay, let's go. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. As English is not my first language, I prepare something to read. I hope it's okay with all of you. Okay, sure, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, here in Argentina, we have a phrase that says, Un union is a strength. I believe that this is what gave us visibility, weight in public opinion, and therefore a political presence that is impossible to deny. I remember that moment and it was unique and historical moment. It was a first an ancestral scream when we heard that the law came out and then a silence while we cried and hugged each other in every corner of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, the voting happened at dawn, so nobody slept that night. Uh, one of my friends here, Anna Julia, stayed with me all night. So, hi, Anna. Thank you for being there. And uh, the excitement and anxiety of happiness was uh, such that we remain awake throughout the rest of the day. It was wonderful to share that moment, understanding that liberation will truly achieve uh, only when we liberate each and every one of us. To have taken the fight to the streets was fundamental. In the streets of Buenos Aires, the green handkerchief <laughs> were hanged in every handbag and in every backpack of women of all ages. Wow. Uh, when there were manifestations, we filled the streets. We protested in front of the Congress and all around the country, the gatherings came out in demand. In addition, the talks about abortion a few years ago began to be more frequent. I remember especially all that happened when the law got half a sentence in Parliament in 2018. I believe that at every table in the country and in many schools the topic was being discussed. Whether for good or for bad, a public debate was created. Family secrets of women who had had abortions could finally come to light. Mm -hmm. This year in particular, things happened that perhaps are not known from the outside, but the campaign for legal abortion has been going on for 15 years now. And the project presented by the government is not the same as the one in the campaign, since modifications were made. It must be understood that in the country, the church still has a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. Senators and deputies have received serious threats to vote against the law. So it is said that the project was reformed so that it could be approved. The problem is that we are always the ones who have to settle for something that should never have been denied to us in the first place. Mm -hmm. Therefore, in order for the law to come out, I consider it was very important that during all these years, with a clear objective, a strong symbolism, and activism in the street, in social networks, and in private life, discussions were generated with all of our close environments, friends, families, colleagues. We had to take a stand consistent with, with solid arguments, using the fear to speak and to confront those who continue to reproduce social mandates that seek to oppress us. In my opinion, the green scarf helped to make visible that we were not alone. In a country where every 20 hours a woman is murdered, mm. the situation was aggravated a lot more in the, with the mental health in the pandemic. It was very important and strong to see the scarf tick, scarf tick in the streets. It generated a sense of security that we had never had before. To go walking down the street and without really knowing each other, to recognize each other, to know that in case of needing help, we could count on ourselves to know that we have each other. The victory affects the lives of regular women. First and foremost, women will stop dying. Legalizing abortion is a matter of human rights and social justice. Before this, women who had access to pay for a doctor in private clinics would have abortions and poor women will die trying, dying from septic abortions. So it, it was never a question of being for or against abortion. It was always really about legal or clandestine abortion. The passage of the law will also help to begin to end the social stigma, the loneliness of women who had to deal, to deal sorry, with being isolated from their surroundings for fear of being judged, for fear of being put in jail. 
we have seen some of the most repugnant things during all these years. We have witnessed how little girls and teenagers were forced to be mothers, how others have, be, have been put in prison, how women have died because of an absent state, and how society pointed out and judged each one. The theme of the campaign has always been sex education to decide, contraceptives not to abort, and legal abortion not to die. So now this new right that we women have conquered will begin to be in sex education in our schools. Hospitals must also implement the protocols of assistance and medical insurance must cover it too. I think the most important thing to understand is that the fight for legal, safe and free abortion did not end here. In principle, we must fight for the law to be properly implemented throughout the country. In the north of Argentina, the societies are ultra-religious and conservative, so we have to be very careful and be attentive to help our sisters who live there, also in the spaces where women with great social and economic vulnerability live, or who are in towns where there is very little access to information or where there is no adequate access to help. We have to make sure that women who are imprisoned for having an abortion get their freedom and to end the maximum problem that usually are how men behave and act, working freely through society, free from stigma and prejudice. We are going to support all our sisters in Latin America so that they too obtain this right, we will try to make America turn green. We will also continue fighting to reform the law in some points where we are not satisfied and do not represent the original campaign, and we will begin to fight for the separation of the church and the state. The church cannot continue to legislate over our bodies. We need a truly secular state. We have many battles front ahead, all products of patriarchy. On the one hand, a movement that wants to erase the political subject of feminism, on the other hand, the religion, and as if that were not enough, capitalism and classism, uh, because we are very afraid that they will use this law in the future to try to legalize the reproductive exploitation of women. But having obtained this law gave us strength, unites us even more. We are excited to be part of the history of feminism. We are strong and we will fight everything that will come. Never again alone, sisters, we have each other. As you will see, there is a lot a lot of work to do. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much, Amina. Um, is there anything that Anna, Julia, that you would like to add to that, or I, because I, you're you're under, I mean, you're from Argentina as well. Um, I think Jimena already said it all. I think it was a very important step for us as a as a class of women being together, knowing that this affects us all, no matter our family name, no matter where you're coming from, no matter anything, how um, where you live in the country. This is a topic for all the all the women, and some of us have a stronger and biggest responsibility to make sure that this law applies to all the Argentinian women. Um, I think I would kind of make that, um, <laughs> kind of say it again uh, after what Hima said. I think Jimena um, said everything very eloquently and she gave a lot of information. And um, I would also say that um, in Argentina, there is also like a big gap between the classes. So it's a very classicist society. Mm -hmm. So um, this is one of the most unfair things that the women had to face when it comes to access to abortion due to this fact, yeah? So this is why we, uh, the ones that can talk a little bit stronger or louder about it, we should make sure that everybody gets the abortion law and applied. Yeah, like they can 
make use of the law, no matter where, where people are in Argentina. Yeah. I think this is, this is basically the, the, the most important. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so what did the Catholic Church do to try to prevent um, you from gaining legal access to abortion? They have a lot of influence here in the country. Uh, they, they made some death threats to our senators and liberties. Yeah, Catholic pe uh, people, or, or are you talking about uh, member, like members of the, not just members of the Catholic Church, but, are, but uh, dignitaries of the Catholic Church, priests and so on, did they make threats? No, the people in general, they, they, they sent emails, they, they went to some of the houses of our politics. Um, when the day that they passed the law in the Congress, they, they were concentrating there also. Um, they were all praying and make a giant, gigantic fetus covered in blood and mm -hmm. start with a with a whole argument with, with the guilt and that conception starts, uh, life, life starts in the conception. And there, there were some violent um, things when we were walking on the street with, with our green scarf, some shouting, some, some violence like that. But it's very difficult. That's the church in Argentina. Sorry, I didn't read. Hold on. Does the church in Argentina pay taxes? In New York, the church hierarchy tells Catholics to vote only for pro-life candidates, but not with. No, Anna, I think that it, it doesn't pay taxes. Um, uh, Anna, estás ahí? I mean, uh, does the church in Argentina pay taxes? In New York, the church hierarchy tells Catholics to vote only for pro-life candidates, but does not pay taxes. Are there groups that are independent from the church hierarchy that opposed you? Let's let's ask the first one. No, you know, first question first. Do does the church in Argentina pay taxes? No, actually, it's the other way around. We we <laughs> pay to the church. I mean, wow. they they are. Um, some schools or places where you can send your kid and you have a, to pay a very little quota compared to other schools or institutions. So we are going to, to fight to separate the church from the state because here it's very difficult. They say that we are, um, that is secular, but it is not in reality. They say that it's what? They say that this is not a religious country, but it, it is not true. Uh, who says that? You mean in Argentina? In Argentina, they say that we, that, that, that everything is that, I mean, oh, hold on. I, I don't get the word in English. Uh-huh. Somos laicos. They say that we are lay people. It's a right lay. Secular. Oh, secular? Not religious? They say that you're secular country? Yes, in the government, but it's not true in reality. Yeah. So when you see the, uh, the Catholic Church gets money, do you mean uh, from all of their parishioners, of course, who, you know, they're always getting a lot of money from, but are you talking about from the government? Do they get money from the government? Yes. They do. Yes, they do. They, they, um, I am searching for the exact price. Wow. Yeah. I'm money to the church. I mean, but I don't know how much exactly. Hold on. Um, yeah. For I found here a donation that the government, that the Argentine government made uh, imposed by the Pope of 16.6 uh, .6 million. 
from the Pope? And the Pope studied this um, with his foundation, Vaticana Scolas Ocurrentes, it is called, and the, our former president, Mauricio Macri, uh, made a, for the grid a donation from the Argentine government. Wow, wow. Yeah, because here, um, you know, the, someone, Amina wrote, uh, in New York, the church hierarchy tells Catholics to vote only for pro-life candidates but does not pay taxes. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the same way with the fundamentalist um, evangelicals. You know, they do a lot of pulpit politicking, is what we would call it, where they call <clears throat> on, uh, you know, their congregations to to support certain candidates and oppose other candidates and support certain laws and policies and oppose others. And uh, in the U.S., they have... They are tax exempt, but we have a um, was I think it was Johnson that put it in into effect that that churches it's called the IRS um, I forget the name of it but uh, if they do pulpit politicking they are um, liable for you know, being having their tax exemption yanked from the Internal Revenue Service, which collects taxes. But um, unfortunately, you know, that has not been enforced hardly at all. So they, they do a lot of that, um, you know, a lot of that arm twisting and so on. Of, and, and then they do direct lobbying as well, you know, of Congress. But... Um, yes. Amina also asked, are there groups that are independent from the church hierarchy that opposed you? Mm, not that much. Maybe in the ultra-right wing, but primarily is, is religious people, uh, Catholic and evangelical. Um, here, uh, I, I searched and I found a law that we have in the state that says that uh, the state has to um, pay the salary of our service and always uh, is like an 80% salary of a judge or so. Bishop, sorry, yes. Uh -huh. Anna, if you want me, please. Yeah, you know, Anna, I've tried to ask you to unmute yourself uh, a few times, but I don't know why you keep getting muted again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So you were, you had written here, the church is being paid with the tax with the taxes from the people. They get money from the Vatican and from the country's taxpayers. Wow. I didn't realize that. Uh, you you want to say more about that and whatever else you wanted to say? Um, yeah, I think I would like to add that this is the second fight that we the feminists in Argentina have to make that the state get separated from the church because mm -hmm. this has been one of the worst influences that we ever got um, in order to block any kind of advances that the women try to do in Argentina. The influence of the church is very strong. Yeah, that is really, oh, I didn't realize it was that bad that they, um, that there's that kind of enmeshment to that that degree. I thought it was more informal, uh, but that's a formal kind of enmeshment. Uh, thank goodness in this country early on, thanks to Thomas Jefferson, uh, you know, we got the separation of church and state or we would be in, in you know, much worse shape here if that hadn't happened. Um, I'm eternally thankful for that. It, although that wall between what we call the wall between the separation of church and state has been getting eroded more and more over time. Um, let me see, just keep your mic on there, Anna, you can help him in a answer. Um, let me see. I would like to add that they also took, uh, took out in parallel 
to the abortion a law to help women to have help from the state if they want to keep their child. And it was done in parallel to, to try to silence the church. Try to silence the church? Yes. They, they took out in parallel an, another law at the same time of the abortion law that says that if the woman, um, if she wants to keep their child, uh, the state is going to help her economically to raise the child since it is called the 1000 days law. Uh -huh. And they, well, this, this was made because they tried to shush a little bit the noise from the church. Uh-huh. Oh, uh-huh. Did you get it? I think so. Anna, did you want to add anything about that? Um, yeah, I think there is something similar in the U.S. that is called alimony or something that the parents have to pay when they get divorced. It would be like an extra money rate that the state used to pay um, that now they took off. Basically, they don't pay it anymore. They introduced some other different systems. But it's like they get, it's always like this. They give us something. In, and then in return, <laughs> they take also something with them. So it's a little bit like that. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, alimony actually in the U.S. means uh, that's for spouses. Like, you know, a wife getting alimony payments from her husband when they divorce or vice versa. Um, <clears throat> yeah, in Argentina, there are a lot of cases where women have their children alone and this kind of is replaced by the state paying for them. So this is why I made like a parallelism with the alimony uh, term because- Oh, I see, yeah. I yeah. see what you're saying. In the, in, the, also in this direction. Kind of, a, a, kind of analogous to that. Yep. So yes, we, we have of course state programs here to help single mothers, but you know, a lot of that has been cut back because of the yeah yeah i mean it's interesting how the the people that are you know supposedly so worried about um about life that you know can't can't possibly live on its own um you know they're they're so worried about that but supposedly you know but they they don't support any kind of programs for for babies or or you know uh, mothers, you know, that, ha that have, uh, that are single parents or any, anything like that. Um, so. One, 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 more. The, one of the modifications that the government made to the law, that it, it wasn't the original law of the abortion campaign, is that now doctors can decide if they do not want to help women for religious reasons. So we, we are going to work to erase that from the new law. Oh, you mean uh, doctors can refuse to, to give you an, an abortion, you mean? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's like the move we have here with the, the whole thing about, you know, it, uh, if it goes against their conscience or something, they can refuse to, even pharmacists and so on, refuse to give you your birth control pills or whatever. Um, I think that's been, those have been struck down pretty much by the courts, but we now have so, as such a swerve to the right in the courts that those kind of things are being um, more recently upheld. Um, <clears throat> So let's see what else is on here. Let me see, I'm having trouble getting this to move so I can see this. Okay. Um, Amina said, I think they should pay their fair share of taxes if they get involved with this issue and other political ca causes. Um, oh, laicos. Laicos means lay people. Yes. Let's see. 
Wait a minute. I just, <laughs> this thing keeps jumping around. Um, okay. Um, if they force women into childbirth, why don't they support those children? Yes, e evangelicals are the worst abusers. Yeah, evangelicals and the Catholics. It was actually the Catholics, believe it or not, uh, that got the evangelicals onto this because uh, back in the day, the Pentecostals, uh, you know, they were they were not involved in politics, but it was actually some Catholics that that uh, came and got the evangelical Pentecostal people, you know, all uh, you know involved in the anti-abortion thing so uh and now you know and it's ironic because the evangelicals despise the catholics and yet they get in bed so to speak with them over the abortion issue which has always been very strange but but you know they can all agree on the uh on the domination and repression of women it seems all these patriarchal religions, but um, Anna said the government is together with the church in Argentina, so the politics are always mixed due to this. The main religion is Roman Catholicism. Let me see. And the president yeah. to be to, to be president has to be Roman Catholic, and even to be able to be elected bishop. Wow. Yeah. You mean that's in the law or is that just because nobody would vote for them if they weren't? It's in the law. <clears throat> Do you know him, Anna? Sorry, I didn't get the question. Is, is that legal? Is that a legal requirement that they be a member of the Roman Catholic Church or is that uh, just because if they aren't, no one would vote for them. I think that is kind of um, implicit. Implicit. Hmm. Okay, so it's not an like actual rule. They don't know about it, but they they don't say. It. Yeah. He doesn't say. It. Yeah, I know it's hard for you to understand. I'm talking probably a little too fast too. Um, let me see. Anna wrote. Wait a minute. Oh. Even be elected, yeah. I said that. Yeah, we have. Oh my goodness, we have all kinds of new messages. Um, Jessica, now also abortion rights finally among the best news for a long time in the world. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, yeah, this is really great news that you were able to do this down there. We're we're very happy for all of you. Thank you. Yeah, let me see here. It uh, was in the Constitution some longer. Um, it used to be in the Constitution that the president has to be Catholic, but not now, not anymore. Okay. But it stays implicit. That's why I mean. But but what was that? Was the last thing you said? That what I meant is that it used to be in the Constitution that the president has to be Catholic, but they took that out, so now not anymore, but uh, it's, it's a stay implicit. Uh huh. Way. Yeah. I see. Well, so. So I was just, uh, <clears throat> this is Anne. I was going to uh, maybe try to get. A little more discussion about how what we can do in the United States to prevent the 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 reality that Argentina had, where women were jailed and women were dying of illegal abortion. Um, that we're really moving in that direction here. It's very frightening, and I know Carol had suggested. Uh, um, Carol Danner had sent a few ideas, uh, but how we can rebuild a movement? How we can resist? Uh, do we need to you know start? Um, Doing more self-help? Do we need to, to start, you know, um, of uh, getting in abortion pills and, and illegally and, and distributing them? I mean, what do we have, and, and how do we get our movement back in the streets 
uh, to demand, uh, you know, full reproductive rights, uh, def to uh, defend abortion rights, and also to, you know, fight for women having real choices in life about whether or not to have children. Wow, what a complex question. <laughs> I know, so I'm just kind of kicking it off, and I'd be interested to see what uh, Imene and Carol uh, Downer has to say about that, and, and anyone else about how, how can we reorganize our movement here, because we're losing we're uh, on the one hand facing female erasure, where we can no longer talk about our bodies and our bodies ourselves and all the things that we did in the past where we talked about you know, our bodies and got to understand our bodies. So we're being, uh, on the one hand being erased as women uh, and that being defined as a gender role. And on the other mm -hmm. hand, we have the right trying to push us back to a uh, time before Roe v. Wade and to start criminalizing women and causing women to die again from not having access to reproductive health care. So we're like <laughs> between a rock and a hard place and it's, it's all like <laughs> closing in on us and how we can build a movement uh, that can speak for women as a sex, our sex-based rights and including in those rights, reproductive rights. Yeah, I, I Mina mean, I wrote in the chat, it is a future and do it yourself with morning after pills, abortion pills and underground networks, mm -hmm. I mean in the US. Yeah, that's my question. Yeah, that's one question, and also how we get get back in the streets, and 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 because we can do that, learn we should learn how to do these things ourselves. Um, at the same time as, but we don't want to be <laughs> faced with jail, right? Mm -hmm. Imprisoned yeah. for doing it either. So uh, there probably has to be a multi-faceted approach. I think. Yeah. So uh, Carol, maybe you can speak to the. You know, the, the idea, the do-it-yourself idea, <laughs> as well as, um, you know, how we can help back. But, you know, can you, can you, first of all, just tell us the menstrual extraction, does that work for pregnancy? Oh, yes. Yes, that, it is very effective <laughs> for pregnancy. Um, a... Um, you know, it's only effective up until about eight weeks, but um, that's when the majority of uh, abortions are done. So, you know, it's it definitely is very useful for that. There are groups uh, presently doing menstrual extraction, very small number, but... Or you're a little bit soft, Carol. Can you turn your volume up a little? Or... Uh, all right, just a second. <clears throat> All right, I, I was saying that, yes, yeah, so it, menstrual extraction is a to eight weeks, and uh, there are groups that are uh, learning. Well, now it's even softer. I, we can barely hear you. Is there background noise there? Now, can you hear me? Um, well, can you hear me now? It's, you keep hearing a scratchy noise in the background more than we hear you. Um, what I'm saying is that the um, Wow. Menstrual extraction is effective up to eight weeks. And that's when the more majority of uh, uh, abortions happen. So it's. Oh. <coughs> yeah, we can't hear you, Carol. Yeah. <coughs> well, I'm sorry about that. It's not working. <coughs> and. Um, okay. Um, well, maybe we can come back to you in a minute. Uh, sure. Jimena or anyone else, do you have any thing you can say? There is another question here. Let me see. Are the pro-lifers in the U.S. Wait a minute. No, okay, stop moving around here, computer. <laughs> um, I can make out what she's saying. We hear you, but not as good as before. Yes, they're targeting. Um, targeting abortion pills and even 
and even birth control here in the U.S., yes. Um, I think that's an answer to this question. Are the pro-lifers targeting just abortion or also the morning after pill or birth control in general? Yeah, they're, they've been trying to do all of those things. Um, <clears throat> luckily so far, you know, we haven't had Roe v. Wade overturned. But um, the thing that we really need to have happen here in the U.S. is the Equal Rights Amendment to get uh, in published into law, into the Constitution by the archivist, and um, Biden has said he's going to definitely be fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment. Once we have standing in the, in the um, federal Constitution, then that's going to be a lot harder for them to, to try to say that we, you know, we, to overturn Roe v. Wade or say that we can't have abortion on demand and uh, because you know as second class citizens they can do all kinds of things to us that they can't uh, if we have some standing but um, I don't know if Carol got her okay can you hear me now yes much better oh great okay <laughs> uh, well just to go back to the question menstrual extraction is useful up to about six, uh, eight weeks. And that is when most abortions uh, usually happen. If you, you know, if you know about your body and you know you've missed uh, your second period, uh, you know, that, that's usually, uh, if you have access, that's when you have it. Uh, so it can, it can be very effective. Uh, there are a few groups who are doing menstrual extraction now. Uh, they are doing it in the form of just extracting your menstrual periods every month. Um, they're not getting into doing uh, later abortions because um, at the moment abortion is legal and available. So, you know, that's, uh, they're, but they're, they're poised, they're, they're ready. Uh, I would say this uh, in terms of uh, our numbers. I've been talking about getting big numbers, but I want to also say that it isn't all about numbers either. Um, and that is, uh, if you can start, it doesn't matter if you're talking about four or six women or, you know, in a community or a hundred, you know, more broadly or whatever. Um, that is a base, but that is enough to get a lot of action going. Because for one thing, it so happens that it's a lot of fun to do self-exam and menstrual extraction and, and uh, it's very joyous. Um, it, uh -huh. It's very energy providing. Um, women who participate in these things uh, find that even if they're um, working and they have very little spare time and so forth, that the time is so rewarding that um, they always come away totally energized. So it, it's not a depleting, you know, sometimes we do very valuable work and, and we, we love to do it, but it depletes us and we get exhausted from doing it. This is not like that. And it, it, I, I'm sure that um, Jimenez will say that her um, participation in Argentina uh, was energy producing. That, you know, you go to a demonstration and you come home and you gas. And that is the beauty of this kind of work, that uh, it really, it grows on itself. It's, and um, so that, that is the encouraging part of it, is it, not to even think about, well, gee, that's just so few of us, what difference can we make or whatever. Um, it um, just get going and um, that it will carry you and other people's energies come in and, and it's, uh, uh, Jimena, <clears throat> are there self-help uh, efforts going on down there? Have there been and are there continuing or no? Sorry, what? I are there self-help kinds of uh, things going on there with women, with uh, groups of women like Carol's talking about, like do you guys 
have people that know how to do menstrual menstrual extraction and things like that? Not menstrual extraction, but we survived till now um, because of women networking together. And that's, that was the only way. We found that some women was in need, so we started networking and find uh, phones or groups of women that help each other and know how to do three things. And that was the way till December, so yeah. yes. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I think it's always important to have those groups. Um, because, you know, you never know what the state might do. <laughs> and it's a, it's a good support in any case. Mm -hmm. That's were, you right. actually doing abor were you actually doing abortions uh, for women? Like uh, they did in Chicago. Uh, there was a Jane Collective that did a regular abortions, not just menstrual extraction, but regular abortions up until, you know, pretty late in the pregnancy. Um, a collective of uh, women in Chicago called the Jane Collective did that in the, I guess in the 60s, late 60s and 70s before it became legal. Were, were you, was an Argentinian woman doing that or, or doing it through the abortion pill or anything like that underground? It was mostly about, about pills, abortion pills, um, and being together and helping each other and trying to, to not to stigmatize the problem because that woman were all alone. They, that, they didn't have anyone because of the social stigma. So uh, it was very important to make networking. The, the problem is that what you were saying um, only happened to the ones, as, as Anna said, this country is very classist. So that thing only happened for women who had the, the economic sustain to, to pay for an abortion. Uh-huh. Yeah. The other died with septic abortions. Yeah, that's what we've said in this country, that always uh, women who had money always had ways of, you know, either traveling somewhere where it was legal or, uh, you know, having a being able to pay a doctor to, uh, you know, to give them a, a therapeutic abortion or whatever. Um, I mean, that the, the important thing to answer your previous question is that right now in Latin America, our sisters in other country took this victory of Argentina to uh, start fighting for their reproductive rights in their own country. It is what Carol said, it, it, it spreads. So I think that the only way is for us to get organized and be united. Uh, there are too many battlefronts um, and we need each other. Yeah. I think that we take advantage of globalization to make noise and make it understood that we are half of the population. Uh, to know that you, all of you in the US uh, have our full support and, and the feminists in, Feminism is by and for all women, and that is why we are fighting for, for our yeah. rights. Yeah, well, we sure are uh, just so thrilled for you that you've gotten this, uh, <clears throat> gotten abortion legal there in Argentina. That's such a wonderful thing, and I, like you say, we hope that it, that it does spread to the other countries. Um, close to you because we have there's so few of them I think it's only um, oh god I can't remember the well Cuba of course but that's not in Latin America but um, the I'm trying to think of the there's one country other than Argentina that has abortion legal and it's the oh I can't think of the name of it. Do you know the one I mean? Uruguay. Uruguay, yes, that's it. Yeah, that's the only other place, isn't it? In all of Latin America, I believe. Yes, and Chile started uh, debating the, the, the law right, um, right now. Yeah. And, they, and Mexico is starting to, to spread the fire too and we are, we are motivated. 
Yeah, that's wonderful. Yes. Well, that very, very good. Good. Uh, has forbidden abortion uh, this week. Oh, let's say that again. Honduras, the mm -hmm. country, has forbidden abortion. Uh, I, I believe that yesterday or the day before yesterday. Did you Honduras? know? Honduras? Honduras, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, they say that it's inside. That country has so much violence right now. And yeah, the U.S. Uh, backed that horrible coup down there. Anyway, uh, is there anything else any of you would like to add or any other questions? Or yes, yes, I have a question for you, Mana. I'm just curious. The victory in Argentina is in any way connected with with the um, movement toward more progressive governments in Latin America, like in Argentina itself, and what happened in Bolivia. There seems to be a, a movement afoot to fight back against all the repressive regimes that were enforced on Latin America by the United States. And I'm just wondering if there is any connection. Sadly, yes. Uh -huh. But no, I mean, no. this is a victory of okay. women, of feminism. We, uh -huh. we took the so many years, we uh -huh. fought too much so that the politics became interested in what we have to say. Uh -huh. But now, uh, in this government, the president, for example, said that uh, they took the victory for, the, for themselves. And they, he even said that... Uh, now we put an end to patriarchy. I mean, what the hell? No. That's <laughs> work to do. So, yes, there is something nasty about that, but uh, we are not paying attention to that. Uh, we are saying that this is our victory, not, mm -hmm. not others. Mm -hmm. he, he, he made a promise in the campaign that when he became president he was going to uh, to to legalize abortion but then he modified all the law and put another things that were weren't in the original campaign mm -hmm. so that is some kind of betrayal but we are going to fight to to change all of that mm -hmm. yeah yeah, very good. Um, Amina had another comment here. Abortion is illegal in Venezuela and Nicaragua, so there is still patriarchy in socialist countries. Oh, yeah, don't we know it? Patriarchy? <laughs> patriarchy lives in all, all of the left. Is, uh, there's several of us, uh, you know, in, in the Green Party that are in, in uh, feminists and struggle, and boy, do we know it. And you know, have been involved in socialist uh, <clears throat> groups as well. Uh, you know, patriarchy is really entrenched, regardless of the political system. Exactly. Uh, yeah, it's global. Jessica wrote. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah, and I always try to remind people that you know, it, patriarchy is kind of a new kid on the block. Because, you know, we had, we had goddess worship, you know, goddess worshiping civilizations for 25,000 years before, you know, we started having these, <clears throat> you know, these patriarchal um, cultures took over, you know, by violence. Um, so, you know, we need to remember that and remind each other about that, you know, that uh, that this has not always been the case, and we can, we can, um, we can change it. But um, is there, uh, Myra? Did you want to say something? Looks like you wanted to. I have to. I can't unmute you. You have to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Um, there's a comment, and. The the oh. chat. I, thank you for unmuting me. I couldn't unmute. That they're asking about punishment. It's a question in the chat, a little further up. 
that wasn't addressed. Oh, yet. okay. Let me see if I can see that. About the punishment for abortion. Oh, yeah. What was the punishment? You mean in Argentina? Yeah, yes, that, yes, correct. Uh huh. Yeah, can you answer that, Jimena? What was the punishment for uh, abortion? Was criminalized, right? Was criminalized uh, and was basically prison. Uh, do you know, like, how long in prison women would get if they um, if they got an abortion or if they performed an abortion? Yes, um, we have right now. Um, it could be two years, fifteen years. I mean, it variates of the of the um, of the conditions that they found of the abortion that they they start analyzing how she do it. Um, how many months does the fetus have? I mean, there, there were all kind of variations, but 15 years, I believe. Wow. Right now, we, we, are, we are asking that the women that are in prison to, to get their freedom because yes. this is, I mean, it's so horrible. Yeah. And as eight years for a miscarriage, for example, and we there was a note that came yesterday no in, in january about uh, some women called rosalia jimena and eliana that are in prison uh, and we are trying to to get them out because this is so unfair yeah that's horrible you know we actually have some women in prison here uh for uh, for even just having a uh, miscarriage because uh, they were accused of, of uh, trying to self-abort. And in some of the southern states, there, there's been at least uh, one case that I know for sure, and I forget which state it is, and I, I don't know what happened about that. Um, because they the state passed a real uh, restrictive horrible law uh, criminalizing abortion there and i i i don't know what the outcome of that was but we've had that happen here even with roe v wade and it being um you know federally legal so yeah some of these states have been trying to get Roe v. Wade overturned by passing these these abhorrent laws um, but they haven't done that yet but you know they've managed to really oppress the women in their state. I believe Carol wants to say something. Okay who um, oh Carol yeah yeah go ahead sorry yeah Right, I just wanted to say that uh, we, you were talking about Parvi Patel, um, who... Yes, uh, yes. Patel, Actually, yes. Uh, she's no longer in prison, thank goodness. Uh, they did um, release her, uh, but she served um, a few months, I'm sure. How, how many months? I don't know exactly, but it seems um, it was after maybe a year, but... I don't. I think it was less than a year. At any rate, she's not in prison at this time. Uh, but um, that was, uh, you know, the um, she was represented by. Um, you know, the, we can barely hear you again, Carol. Mm -hmm. What? I'm sorry. What? Um, yeah. What? What did you say? Well, I guess I'm not hearing. That makes me held it hurt again. Can barely hear you again. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's a little better. But yeah, do you remember which state that was? Um, actually, I don't. It was in the middle of the country. I know that. It Seems like Tennessee or something. Yeah, they could. That sounds very possible. And. Um, <clears throat> Just in terms of, of people, if they're thinking of, uh, you know, conducting, if, of learning to do abortion or uh, 
distribute pills or whatever it may be. Um, certainly, um, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's all, uh, my big advice to people in these situations, of course, in, in the case of, of Harvey, she was no, not a member of a group. Uh, she did this um, in isolation. Um, well, I don't know. I, yeah, we can barely hear you. I don't know what happened to your sound. It was fine earlier, but it has. We're working on it. You don't have headphones or anything. Uh, no, I don't. I use hearing aids. Um, well, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. Um, okay, there you go. Is that better? Yes, okay. for the moment. Is it better? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead and say what you're going to say. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just saying for those who, you know, are thinking of, of doing things where they, um, you know, are either doing abortions or distributing pills or uh, assisting women to get pills, whatever, uh, action people might choose to do. Uh, I really, really advise them to um, develop a, 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 a war chest, you know, and to um, create a, a group support in the community for their work. Isolation is just uh, the the worst thing because uh, it, like in the case of Parvi Patel, uh, she was. Um, you know, a young person, and she had no support system, and she was very, it, she did get national support eventually, but, um, and that did certainly help, uh, but I think uh, better to avoid uh, getting involved with these authorities, so sometimes even if, uh, let's say that we're in a uh, situation where we don't want to uh, take that kind of risk, or maybe it's not appropriate in our area or situation, uh, we can form support groups to uh, link up and network and help women uh, and women's groups who are uh, willing to do this. I, I think that that is the future, uh, is not only uh, many, many different um, activities by different groups, uh, ch challenging the law in different ways, doing what we did before, which was, you know, traveling, sending women out to other areas to get abortions. Because I predict that's what's going to happen. I don't think they're going to um, wholesale outlaw abortion. Uh, I think um, they're smarter than that. I think they are probably going to go back to the pre-Roe v. Wade situation where it will be legal in some areas and not in others. Um, you know, they're eventually... Well, once once we get the ERA passed, it's, you know, we can really fight this much more effectively. It's so unfortunate that because of this attack on reproductive rights and, and the, um, the unbelievable opposition of, you know, the, the right wing um, church mainly, uh, that if we got derailed from getting the Equal Rights Amendment passed back in the early 80s, and instead we started having to put out fires everywhere on reproductive rights. And if that, you know, if it had been the other way around, had we gotten the Equal Rights Amendment passed, we wouldn't have had to do all this, you know, state by state and issue by, you know. <laughs> well, I, I have to say, though, uh, you know, there's, um, there is a, there is a real um, ambivalence in the women's liberation movement broadly, and this is uh, a tension between the head and the heart and the body. Um, that is that a, a lot of the women's movement. Um, a lot of women in the women's movement, I should say, are, are just wanting to be uh, equal with men uh, in the sense of being more like them. Uh, and, you know, to have, to have the ability to go out and work a 40-hour work week, et cetera, rather than thinking in terms of fighting for an, a society that honors our 
our biology and we honor it ourselves. Yeah. And that tension happens. And applying it here to the Equal Rights Amendment, I don't think we're going to get that Equal Rights Amendment until we do get the reproductive rights because they're much deeper in us. And I well, don't think we can gloss them over and skip over them and just seek these. Not, I mean, I've, I'm all for the ERA. That has well, nothing to do with Well, that. actually, I don't know if you know this, but um, we got the 38th state to, to uh, ratify in January of last year. So uh, we've been fighting the Trump administration. You know, they, and, you know, some, I think it was the attorney general of Alabama or somewhere that, um, that prevented the archivist from recording it in the constitution. So, and so now there's both a, you know, both Biden has said that, you know, he, he will be, so the, the administration will be fighting for that, but also there's a, another um, <clears throat> bill in Congress to um, overturn the, all the, those phony uh, time limits <laughs> that they had on there that really are very pretty uh, spurious, honestly, but they have a, a bill to do away with that, which is one of the last last gasp ways of trying to derail the actual, uh, you know, official recognition of, you know, the Equal Rights Amendment having been ratified. So hopefully we're like right on the cusp of that, all of that uh, getting out of our way finally. Um, well, I, I, I definitely hope so, and I would, I, I unfortunately, having um, made a, my lifetime mission to understand the population control forces in this world and the uh, the history of it and the role that it plays in in politics, um, I, I just think it's the elephant in the room, and you know, even though. Uh, everybody gives lip service to reproductive rights uh, and they always put it on their, uh, you know, list of things that they uh, want and so forth. Um, they they kind of want to, um, they, they would much rather do things that are more cerebral and, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and not get into this messy business of, uh, you know, having to look at our bodies and talk about menstrual periods and stuff. Yeah. And, but you know, I, but yeah, I hear you. <laughs> if, if it can be done. Um, I mean, I don't know how, well, I, I don't know how, how you can be optimistic about the ERA with the uh, Supreme court uh, makeup that we have right this minute. Um, yeah, well, the thing that's good about the ERA is that it, it basically, you know, they, the time has passed for, you know, the approval of these bodies because it's already gone through the entire process. So they don't really have a say in, um, once that's in the Constitution, then that it's in there unless they want to pass another constitutional amendment to Try, try to, do, you know, delete it, um, which is a very long and arduous process, as we know. But I wanted to read, Eleanor said she had to go. Thank you so much for this event. I need to go soon. The news about Honduras, I did not know. So thank you, Hamina yeah. and Anna, for telling me about that. I will be at an abortion rights executive meeting tomorrow and we'll feedback on some of the items discussed today. I, uh, what was that? I tick the, yeah. Yeah. something, I, the, I don't know what that says. I, it says tick, I tick the, wait a minute. Um, come on, I'm getting, I'm having trouble getting my getting this thing to move down so I can see the, let me just 
click on that. Okay. Um, I have a little bit written about Honduras, if you want to know a little more. Women's human rights and our conditions and needs. Let's see here. We all need to work together and support each other. Um, it is 11 p.m. in the UK, so I'll be signing off. Thank you for the event. I found it very interesting. Uh, indeed, we need to stay together, Jimenez, Jimenez said. said. Uh, Amina, the fact that the ERA has been stalled, so I can't see the rest of that. And I will not move. I don't know why. Yeah, some of these technical things are enough to drive you crazy. Um, I can't see the, Anne, can you see the bottom? Is Anne there? Can you see the bottom of that, of the chat to see the other comments? I can't, I can't yeah, see. I think I can, can you hear me? Um, yeah. I agree, Carolyn, getting to be as men is not a win, women, human rights on our conditions and needs. And then uh, agree to, and Eleanor says, agree to that. Good night, sisters. So. Okay, I guess that's all. I thought Jimena had, had said something, but anyway. Need, uh, yeah, uh, indeed, we need to stay together. Uh-huh, okay. So all right, well, very good. Thank you so much, everybody, for being okay. here. And thank you, all of our guests, thank Jimena, you. Diaz, and also Anna, um, and and Carolyn Downer, and uh, Rochelle Glickman, and everyone who is here. We appreciate your participation. Let me just take one pitch uh, that yeah. uh, for those in the U.S. Um, to consider joining Feminists in Struggle, which is feministstruggle.org. Uh, we do recruit. So, and we're trying to build a grassroots uh, feminist movement in the United States. Yeah, so check out our website at feministstruggle.org. Um, we will continue to have these feminist forums on various uh, subjects. We've had, had some on some really interesting subjects. One was on the ERA, actually, <laughs> a few months ago. And that one... Um, you know, if you join, if you join Feminists and Struggle, you'll be able to watch the whole video on that. We didn't get that one publicly okayed, so, uh, or okayed to be, to be public, so. Uh, but we have, we have one coming out on the Feminist Amendments to the Equality Act, that that will be a public video as well. But uh, check us out, again, feministstruggle.org. Thank you again for joining us today and we'll say goodbye then. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye Myra. Bye. bye. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.